This is my first video update coming to you from Athens, Greece on this Monday morning. Let's talk about some news. And the big story that we have to talk about is a Financial Times article, which claims that uh, the EU, EU ministers will indeed impose a Russian travel ban. They are going to suspend the visa facilitation agreement that was put in place between Russia and the EU in 2007. I have talked uh, a lot about this, uh, this uh, proposed Russian travel ban. And um, this was an idea that was originally floated out by various Baltic nations, Poland, Finland, uh, Czech Republic, where they would like the uh, European Union to, uh, to suspend this visa facilitation agreement, which basically is an agreement which allows Russians to obtain um, a multi-entry, multi-length Schengen visa to, uh, to travel to the European Union. And this visa can last for six months to five years and it allows Russians to, uh, to enter the European Union, enter EU member states uh, for 90 days, every 180 days, three months for every uh, six months. And you just have to get it once and it expires after, after um, a, a lengthy time period, say. You don't have to continue to, to get visas over and over again when you want to visit the European Union and Russia has the same uh, agreement for uh, EU member states as well. If you're traveling to Russia, then you can, uh, under this agreement, you can also get a multi-entry, multi-length visa as well to visit the Russian Federation. Well, it looks like uh, this will indeed be suspended. I, uh, I think in my last video, I said the odds of this being suspended are around 60, 65 70 percent that says something like that and i was talking about a statement from uh from cyprus and portugal where they came out and said do not suspend this uh this visa don't uh don't impose a russian a russia travel ban uh germany has come out and said this is not a good idea to their credit even joseph burrell said suspending russian travel is not a good idea but in my video i said Cyprus and Portugal, they're coming out against this plan, but Cyprus is a small country. It can easily be, uh, be swayed. It's not, it's not a very powerful EU country. It doesn't have much, uh, much leverage in the European Union. And then all you have is Portugal, which is isolated in its stance against imposing a travel ban. So I said, most likely, the EU, they're going to impose this uh, this travel ban. And uh, it's as we have said on the Duran over and over again, the EU, these guys, these uh, EU kleptocrats, they have no reverse gear. They have no humility. They, uh, they have no, uh, no admission of... Uh, it's impossible for them to admit that they've lost. It's impossible for them to pull back. They have no reverse deep gear and their hysteria, hate, bigotry, racism is now out there for the entire world to see in the form of this Russian uh, travel ban that is about to take place if you believe the story from the uh, Financial Times and I see no reason not to believe this report from the FT, they have good sources embedded in the European Union. This is like an Eye of Sauron statue here. <laughs> the Eye of Sauron. Um, <laughs> it watches over us. Here, is some, uh, here are some quotes from this Financial Times article, according to a senior EU official. This is what uh, they told the Financial Times. It is inappropriate for Russian tourists to stroll in our cities on our marinas we have to send a signal to the russian people that this war is not okay it's not acceptable another eu official was quoted as saying 
we are in an exceptional situation and it requires exceptional steps. We want to go beyond suspending the visa facilitation. The EU official stated that additional restrictions could be adopted by the end of the year, according to the Financial Times. All right, so it is inappropriate for Russian tourists, tourists to stroll in our cities on our marinas. On our cities and on our marinas. It's inappropriate, according to this, uh, to this EU official. So the European Union, I've read estimates saying that the EU is going to lose anywhere between 25 and 35 billion in lost revenue from Russian tourism. I wonder if this EU official asked the tourist association, the hotel association, the restaurants, all of these uh, citizens of various EU countries who, uh, who benefit from Russian tourism. I wonder if they asked them how they feel about the, uh, the inappropriateness of Russians booking hotel rooms, eating food at restaurants, going to bars, shopping, and, and all of these things that uh, tourists, especially Russian tourists, do when they visit uh, an EU country. I wonder if uh, the EU official asked their tourist industry about the inappropriateness of Russians to uh, Wow, to stroll EU city streets and marinas as if the EU cities are made of gold and the Russians should feel privileged to, to be afforded the opportunity to actually walk on those uh, EU city streets and on those EU marinas. The arrogance of this statement, the absolute arrogance of this statement from an EU official. It's, it's unbelievable. Well, pretty soon, give it one month, these uh, EU city streets, well, they're not going to have any lights. <laughs> they're not going to have any lights. They're not going to have any heat. And they're not going to have any hot water. And uh, I think Russian tourists are going to probably avoid visiting the European Union given these... Uh, these facts that are about to to come to the EU. So um, the other statement, the other quote, we want to go beyond suspending the visa facilitation. Additional restrictions could be adopted. And a full Russian travel ban, a full Russia travel ban. That's the next step. What do I mean by that? Well, they're going to suspend the multi-entry visa the multi-length, multi-entry visa is going to be suspended. They're still going to allow, from what I understand, they're still going to allow single-entry, simple visas, which basically means that every time someone in Russia wants to travel to an EU member state, they're going to have to go to their local consulate or embassy, pay the fee, apply to get a visa, and that visa is going to have an entry date and an, and an expiry date. Usually these simple visas um, cannot go any longer than 30 days. And that's it. When you want to visit the country again, you're going to have to go back to the consulate, back to the embassy, reapply, pay the fees and go through the whole process again. So they'll probably still issue those types of visas, the single entry, simple visas. But Probably by the winter, according to this EU official, they'll ban that as well. So you're going to be looking at a full-on Russian uh, travel ban, a full Russian uh, visitation ban into the European Union. And so what does Russia do? Well, I talked about this in a previous video that I did about a week ago. The Russian foreign ministry, they can do nothing. They can just leave the current visa regime as is and just ignore this this hysteria, this hatred, this bigotry from the European elite. Just ignore it and move on and just continue to win the war in Ukraine, win the economic war against the collective West, win the energy war against the collective West and just let that do all the talking. The foreign minister can retaliate in kind, tit for tat. So they could also say, well, if you're gonna ban EU, uh, travel, if you're going to ban Russian travel to the EU, then we're going to ban 
EU travel to Russia under the uh, the facilitation deal, and they could they could just reciprocate exactly in the same way that uh, the EU has uh, done in kind, or the Russian foreign ministry, the Russian government can say, you know what, we're not going to uh, to show hatred towards European Union citizens. We don't want to prevent our countries, our cultures from interacting, which is, a, which is another reason why the EU does this. They're very sinister. They're very evil, these EU kleptocrats. Their hatreds, their hatred for Russia, their hatred for Russians and the Russian people is also about preventing you and me from communicating, discussing and meeting people from Russia and coming to our own conclusion that we're not that different. We actually get along. We can actually like each other outside of politics. The EU kleptocracy, they don't want that. That is why they don't want Europeans traveling to Russia, because if Europeans travel to Russia, as I've stated um, in previous videos during the 2018 World Cup that Russia hosted, and how the uh, how the UK government tried to fear monger their citizens from traveling to Russia. What usually happens is that when you travel to Russia, you come to the conclusion that this place is just really nice. It's really cool. And these people are really good people. The EU doesn't want that. They don't want us to experience that. And that is what many people in the UK, many football fans in the UK realize when they travel to Russia. They ignored their government's fear mongering. They went to Russia during the World Cup and they were like, this is great. We got along. We watched the games with uh, with the Russians. We drank our beers. We had a good time. We're really not, not that different. This is what the EU absolutely does not want. They want to keep us divided. They want to keep us filled with hate like what they're filled with because they're filled with hate. So they want us to be filled with hate. So what was I saying? So Russia can take a different approach. The foreign ministry can take a different approach and say, you know what? We're not going to go down the path of hate. As a matter of fact, we're going to keep our visas in place, the multi-entry, multi-length visa. We're going to keep that in place. We're not going to abolish that. And we're going to extend our electronic visa right now it's 16 days let's make it 21 days or let's make it 30 days so you can get an electronic visa online and visit russia no need to go to the embassy no need to go to the consulate just fill out a simple form online and you can get an electronic visa for 30 days and everyone come to russia european union citizens are welcome in russia that should be the marketing campaign if you're listening to this foreign ministry this should be your marketing campaign. EU citizens are welcome here. We want you to visit Russia. We want you to see our beautiful cities. We want you to stroll. We want you to stroll in our beautiful cities and our marinas. For us, it's not inappropriate to have you visit our beautiful country. That is what Russia should say. For us, we want you here. We want you uh, visiting us. We want you booking hotels, going to our restaurants, visiting our museums. Everyone is welcome here. That should be the approach from uh, Russia for tourism, for tourism with regards to the European Union. Anyway, um, other countries are going to look on this and they're going to say outside of the collective West, outside of the 15, 20 percent of the collective West countries, they're going to look at this and they're going to say, huh, that's interesting. So these EU kleptocrats really are, um, you know what, <laughs> I was going to say a bad word. So these guys really do, uh, do think like this. They really do hate other countries and other cultures. And other countries are going to look at this and they're going to say, well, today they're banning travel for uh, Russians, but tomorrow it could be us. Tomorrow it could be China. Tomorrow it could be India. It could be Brazil. It could be South Africa. It could be Indonesia. Why not? If they do it to Russians, why won't they do it to, uh, to other countries and other cultures? Absolutely. And uh, the Russian citizens, they're going to look at this and they're going to say, 
you know what? The Kremlin was right. They really do hate us. And the Kremlin can come out and they can say, you see, we told you so. We told you that the collective West, the EU kleptocrats, they wanted to destroy Russia. They hate us. They were using Ukraine as a proxy to eventually destroy the Russian Federation. We told you that this is a war not against Ukraine, but that this is a war against NATO and the collective West and the imperialists in the collective West and the hegemon of the, uh, the collective West and NATO. We told you that this is what this was about. Now they can say that and they're right. And they're right. That's what this shows. That is exactly what this shows. So this, this policy, man, this is so dumb and so, and so misguided and it is going to turn around and shoot the EU. They don't even have any more feet left to shoot themselves. They've shot themselves in both feet. They've shot themselves in the lung, as Viktor Orban said during a speech. They've, sh they've shot themselves everywhere. There's just nowhere left for them to shoot themselves. This is just such a terrible, terrible move from the European Union. But hey, you know, no reverse gear. They're filled with hatred and hysteria because they're losing. They're losing so bad on the economic front and they're losing so bad on the ground in Ukraine and they're being demilitarized. And, uh, and the whole thing is just one big mess. And instead of them, Instead of these EU guys reversing course, nope, they have to dig deeper and deeper and deeper. They have to keep on digging that hole. This is why Russia, <laughs> this is why the Kremlin and the Security Council and the Putin administration, this is why they don't have to move faster with regards to the special military operation. In my, in my view, as much as I would like this to end, in my view, the slower Russia moves, the more the EU destroys itself. If Russia were to wrap up this conflict tomorrow, then there's a possibility that the European Union would actually save itself. <laughs> it would come to its senses and save itself. But the longer this drags on, the more the people in the Kremlin can just kind of sit back and say, yeah, just keep on going slowly, slowly. We're in no rush. Look at the European Union implode. Every day, they make a dumber and dumber decision. I'm positive that, that, that the Security Council, they're holding meetings in the Kremlin. They're probably sitting there going, we couldn't have thought up. They're probably laughing, saying we couldn't have thought up a better way for the European Union to disintegrate than what these clowns are doing in Brussels. <laughs> it's, it's incredible. It's incredible to watch. That's why Russia is impressed to move quicker. They don't need to. The EU is destroying itself perfectly fine. Perfectly fine. So, uh, talking about the popularity of the European Union <laughs> and how they think everyone loves them, the EU kleptocrats, they think everybody loves us. Well, did you see Macron's uh, the reaction given to Macron when he visited Algeria. I'm going to, I'm going to find the video and I'm going to put it down below in the description box, a link to it. Maybe I'll even put it on the screen without any sound. But Macron in the video, he's walking the streets of, uh, of Algeria and, and there are the crowds there lined up and he thinks, and he thinks the people are, are chanting praises for Macron in France. When in fact, and this is what Macron thinks, he actually thinks the people are praising him when in fact, when in fact, the people were cursing Macron. They were booing Macron. And only later did he realize the contempt that uh, the crowds in Algeria have for Emmanuel Macron. And it got so bad that um, the French government had to actually make up some silly claim that it's Turkey fueling the hatred of Algeria for France. 
they actually threw the blame on Turkey and Erdogan. <laughs> that is why Macron, when he strolls through the streets of Algeria, is greeted with boos and jeers. It's Turkey's fault. Not France's fault. Turkey's fault. Macron claimed that Turkey, alongside with Russia and China, of course, because it's always Russia and China, right? It's always blame Russia and China and Trump. Russia, China, and Trump. <laughs> and now Turkey. Everyone watching this from Turkey, now you're going to be blamed for everything as well. Welcome to the club. <laughs> Welcome to the club, people from Turkey. Uh, Macron claimed that Turkey, alongside Russia and China, are building certain activist networks that supposedly pursue a neo-colonialist and imperialist agenda while spreading anti-French propaganda and portraying Paris as an enemy of Africa. <laughs> it's, the, it's, it's the Turkish people, it's the Erdogan government that is building um, the hatred of Africa towards France, that is fueling the hatred of Africa towards France. <laughs> there, Turkey is involved in, in pursuing a neo-colonialist and imperialist agenda in Algeria. Well, okay. That, that, does Macron not know the history of France at all? Has he not read his history books? I, I, I'm stunned. I'm stunned at, at these statements. It, um, <laughs> this, this should be my clown world. Let's see. The Turkish ministry called Macron's accusations most unfortunate and unacceptable, adding that the French president apparently has difficulties in confronting his colonial past in Africa, especially in Algeria. France seeks to deal with this matter by accusing other nations of malicious activities, the ministry statement added. If France supposes that there are sanctions against it in the African con if there are reactions against it in the African continent, it should search for the source of those reactions in its colonial past and its efforts to still pursue this with different methods, the statement said. Any attempts to explain to explain anti-French sentiments in Africa by some third nation's activities is nothing but a denial of history that only shows the distorted mentality of some politicians. That is a statement from the Turkish foreign ministry. <laughs> well said, well said. The Turkish foreign ministry also said that Turkey is a strategic partner. One minute. As the ambulance goes by, the Turkish foreign ministry stated that Turkey is a strategic partner of the African Union and it encourages friendship and friendship and encourages friendship, not hostility on the continent. The ministry said Ankara hopes that Paris would eventually reach the maturity to face its colonial past without blaming other countries. It added, wow. Yeah. Talk about uh, a big time takedown from uh, the Turkish foreign ministry. Look. Turkey's foreign ministry is is top notch. Kavosuglu is a is is a top level uh, diplomat, one of the best in the uh, in the business, and so this was probably uh, a real easy one for him to uh, to respond to. I'm sure that Kavosuglu saw the statements from uh, from Macron against Turkey, and he said, "Just give me five minutes, I'll craft uh, a good response here." This was a this was an easy one for the Turkish ministry to handle, and boy, did they, they really stuck it to Macron. But, uh, you know, this shows you, th this story right here is connected to the Russia travel ban. It shows you the arrogance, the elitism, the, uh, the bigotry, the discrimination. It, 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 it's perfectly displays it, the statement from Macron, and, um, and how they're just looking now to shift the blame on Turkey. It's Turkey's fault now. No, it's Russia's fault. No, it's China's fault. No, it's Trump's fault. No, it's Putin's fault. No, it's Erdogan's fault. It's everyone's fault, but theirs. Everyone's to blame, but them. Uh, <laughs> let's do like one, one, one more story. Let's do one more story and um, we'll wrap it up. 
uh, let's see. The, uh, the Austrian chancellor, by the way, is, is now calling on the EU. He wants uh, a special energy meeting. Actually, the EU is going to hold a special energy summit because, you know, the, the EU is, 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 is such a, a beacon of light and hope for uh, people to visit that uh, <laughs> for those Russians to travel to that they have to hold emergency energy summits. Anyway, the, uh, the Austrian chancellor, he wants to um, he wants to separate decouple electricity charges from the price of gas. And, you know, the, the reason he wants to do this is because electricity prices in in the EU have gone up by 10 X. I mean, you're talking 400, 600, so, so, some places 700 euros a megawatt hour. And this is from like 50 euros, what it was just six months ago, 50 euros at most is, is what it used to be. And now you're looking at 600 and 700 euros for the megawatt hour. And uh, the Austrian chancellor is saying that a lot of this is, is due to the fact that uh, the pricing for electricity is connected to the price of gas. And this needs to be decoupled. Let's see here. The chancellor, the chancellor of Austria, Karl Nieheimer, I think I said prime minister, the chancellor said, we must finally stop the madness that is taking place in energy markets. And that can only happen through a European solution. Something has to happen at last. This market will not regulate itself in its current form. I call on all EU 27 to stand together to stop this price explosion immediately oh he also blamed it on putin we cannot let putin determine the european electric electricity price every day he added referring to russia's control of much of europe's gas supply <laughs> of course it's putin's fault no it's erdogan's fault no it's xi jinping's fault no it's trump's fault so yeah he wants to okay this is going to be discussed at the energy uh, summit. Uh, the chancellor of Austria would also like to put a uh, price cap on uh, oil as well. That's going to work out. That's going to work out real good. <laughs> yeah, put a price cap on oil. Do that. Why don't you? You see why the Kremlin can take things slow? You see why they don't have to rush? <laughs> this, is, this is why. This is why. You got a bunch of knuckleheads in uh, Brussels. They don't need to move quickly. As a matter of fact, the slower Russia moves, the, uh, the quicker the EU destroys itself. The slower Russia moves, the quicker the EU destroys itself. That is, that's how this, this, this works. Uh, so we have that news as well coming out of Austria. Real quick, uh, an update on uh, Alexander Dugin and uh, the assassination of his daughter, Daria Dugina. Dukin said that uh, during a documentary that's being that's being uh, prepared now with regards to this murder, Alexander Dukin actually said that the murder of his daughter was no mistake. I quote, it was no mistake. Every effort was made to kill her. She was the target. This is what he told the documentary filmmakers. Why was Daria Dugina killed? That's the that's the documentary that they're preparing. Why was Daria Dugina killed? And it's going to be aired on Russia's channel one so um dukin has said that it was indeed daria that was the target he said that his daughter was targeted because she championed the russian idea the idea of great power statehood security for our people and our nation that is why uh dukin said she was killed so um that documentary is going to be coming out in Russia. How do you think that's going to play to the domestic market in Russia? Travel ban on Russians, a documentary about the assassination of a 30 year old uh, journalist and Russian patriot. How do you think all this stuff plays out to the uh, Russian people? Is it any wonder why Putin's approval rating is at 99.999%? Is it any wonder EU, EU dummies, EU dodo bureaucrats, why this is happening? All right. So since we're talking about elites, 
our elite class, I will do a clown world. And, uh, and this clown world, oh, real quick, let me just throw this in there before I get to my clown world. Alensky gave another statement, uh, one, of his one of his nightly statements uh, yesterday. And uh, he said that uh, Ukraine is going to recapture the Donbass. We have not forgotten and will not forget any of our cities and any of our people. Now Donbass is almost destroyed by Russian strikes, devastated the proud and glorious Ukraine. Ukrainian Donetsk was humiliated by the Russian occupation and robbed, but Ukraine will return for sure. Life will return. The dignity of the people of the Donbass will return. The ability to live will return. The opportunity to live safely and happily, Zelensky said. He said, uh, he also said that the Ukrainian flag will symbolize when we set it up in Donetsk, Korlovka, Mariupol, in all cities of Donbass. This is what the Ukrainian flag symbolizes, he says, when they set it up in these cities and the Azov area, in all areas under Russian occupation, in Kharkov, Zaporozhye, Kherson regions, and definitely in Crimea. Ukraine remembers everything, he said. Anyway, I'm reading his statement very quickly because obviously Olensky is, is making these statements after he he takes part in uh, in that sugary white su substance, <laughs> right? <laughs> what is... Oh, what is uh, I, th I think Scott Ritter calls it the fairy, the, the magic fairy dust or something like that. Or, or what is it in Finland? The flower, the flower gang, <laughs> the flower group <laughs> that uh, he partakes in. Anyway, um, <laughs> yeah, Alensky's all out of his mind. And of course, he's going to say, give us more weapons. So he makes this, these statements and then he says, give us more money and give us more weapons because I have to buy uh a 12th house in London. So <laughs> more money, more weapons. Anyway, let's do our clown world since we're talking about our uh, dummy elite class. This clown world is courtesy of uh, Robert Barnes and also courtesy of Jimmy Dore. Because I saw Jimmy Dore talking about the master class of George W. Bush and uh, the great Robert Barnes send me, <laughs> sent me the actual class as well. So there's this internet site called Masterclass, and what they do is they get experts to speak about stuff that they're experts in. Like, uh, I don't know, Gordon Ramsay speaks about what it's like to be a master chef, or Martin Scorsese, you know, gives a class about how to be a great director. And uh, I was watching the Jimmy Torch show, and they had the video of the latest Masterclass, which is from George W. Bush, talking about what it means to be a great leader. <laughs> I'll put a link. I'll, I'll find the advertisement for this masterclass and put a link down below. You have to watch it. I can't do it any justice uh, because it's, it's just so bonkers. It's so out of this world. And it, once again, it shows how out of touch the elite class is with reality. How out of touch they are with reality. War criminal George W. Bush, who launched the Iraq War the Afghanistan war. He's actually giving a master class on leadership and integrity. <laughs> and, and the advertisement that Robert sent me actually shows that this is a master class. This is a series of master class of master classes. And uh, it's not only going to going to be George W. Bush, who's going to give a master class on leadership and integrity. It's also going to be um, Hillary Clinton. <laughs> I think Bill Clinton was in the poster as well. Uh, Condoleezza Rice. And uh, I guess they recorded it before she, uh, she passed away. Madeline Albright. Madeline Albright is, doing, is, is giving a master class or recorded a master class before she died on leadership. <laughs> Madeline Albright who said in a video statement, yeah, fi killing 500,000 Iraqi children is perfectly acceptable. Who, uh, who championed the illegal and barbaric bombing of uh, Serbia and Belgrade. That Madeline Albright, she's also going to be giving a master class Oh boy, I felt like this whole video was one big clown world. Anyway, I will leave it there, everybody. The Duran.locals.com. Check out Alexander's channel. 
check out the Durant's channel. Look for us on Rumble, Odyssey, BitChute, and Telegram. Join us on Telegram as well. Take care.